Following on from the discussion of group theory, we're going to have a look at another set and the binary operation and prove that they form a group. Today, we're looking at the set containing the nth roots of unity. So consider a complex number z such that z to the n, where n is some integer, is equal to 1. We want to actually be able to find these roots of unity explicitly, so let's go ahead and write 1 in complex exponential form. 1 is equal to e to the i times 0, because anything to the power of 0 is 1. But if we look at our complex plane, so we have 1 here, but we could take our complex number and rotate it, any integer multiple of 2 pi, and we'll still be back at 1. So we could actually write that 1 is equal to e to the i 2 pi times some integer k, where k starts at 0 and then just goes up to infinity. So we can take this form and substitute it back into the equation we're trying to solve. z to the n is equal to e to the i 2 pi k for some integer k, and then just take both sides to the power of 1 over n, which will give us that z is equal to e to the i 2 pi over n times k. Because what we're dealing with here is an nth order polynomial, it must have at most n roots. So k will start at 0 and then run up to n minus 1, so that we actually get n roots. We could of course have k starting at 1 and then going all the way up to n, and this would still give us n roots. And equally we could just have k starting at 2, going to 3, and then going up to n plus 1. This would give us the exact same set of roots. We might actually want to go ahead and label our roots, say zk equals e to the i 2 pi over n times k. Or we can write them in an even better way by noticing that zk is equal to e to the i 2 pi over n to the power of k. So we could let this part in the brackets here be equal to omega. So omega equals e to the i 2 pi over n and then write that zk is equal to omega to the k. So we can get each root of unity by taking successive powers of omega. k starts at 0, so we know that our first root, z0, is going to be equal to omega to the 0, which is equal to 1. So the roots always start at 1, but if we were to write down a set of roots, we'd have 1 e to the i 2 pi over n, this is a k equals 1 case, then e to the i 4 pi over n, k equals 2, and then that will go up to k equals n minus 1. We could write this in terms of omega. We could have 1, omega, omega squared, omega cubed, all the way up to omega to the n minus 1. And this is our set of the roots of unity. So we might actually want to label it. We could write big omega is equal to z, such that z to the n equals 1, and z is complex. There are loads of ways that we could write this set. Really, that's not really important. Our aim here is to prove that this set forms a group under multiplication. So if you remember back to my video explaining groups, we need to actually show that this set with multiplication conforms to the group axioms. So let's start with the first axiom, closure. So first looking at closure. The axiom of closure states that if we consider any two elements in the group, say omega to the k, omega to the r, omega to the k times omega to the r should also be a member of the group. And that should be true for any general elements in the set. So let's actually consider their product. So say so we have omega to the k times omega to the r. Well, we're just dealing with normal multiplication here. So this will be omega to the k plus r. There are two cases that we consider here. We could have that k plus r is less than n. So in other words, we have that k plus r is a member of 0, 1, the integers all the way up to n minus 1. And that's fine. That just means omega to the k plus r is definitely a member of our set. However, it's also perfectly possible that k plus r is greater than or equal to n. And we need to consider this case with a little bit more thought. In the case that k plus r is greater than or equal to n, well, we know that for both k and r, they're in the right range. So from 0 all the way up to n minus 1. So if k plus r is greater than or equal to n, then we can write k plus r is equal to n plus some small amount epsilon 
where epsilon is also in the range that we'd like k plus r to be in. So up to m minus 1. So if this is true, then omega to the n plus, sorry, omega to the k plus r is equal to omega to the m plus epsilon. And then we could write this as omega to the n times omega to the epsilon. But we know by, but we know by definition that omega to the n is equal to 1. So we know that omega is equal to e to the i 2 pi of n. So omega to the n will be e to the i 2 pi, which is 1. So we could write this as 1 times omega to the power of epsilon, which is just equal to omega to the epsilon. And because epsilon is in the right range, omega to the epsilon will definitely be a member of the set. So we've just proved that for any k and r, omega to the k times omega to the r is always a member of the set. So closure is definitely satisfied. Next, we might just want to go up and give ourselves a bit more space to look at the second axiom, which is associativity. So associativity is basically a statement that if we consider any omega to the k, omega to the r, and say omega to the m, omega to the k times omega to the r times omega to the m in brackets is equal to omega to the k times omega to the r times omega to the m. So this is a statement that ordering doesn't matter. We need to actually prove that this holds for any general k, r, and m. Because we're working multiplication, this seems like a fairly obvious statement. It should just be true intuitively, but often these are the hardest things to prove. Just conceptually, it's kind of hard to know where to start with them, but it's actually really simple. So let's just start with the left-hand side. Omega to the k times omega to the r times omega to the m. Well, that's equal to omega to the k. First dealing with the part in the brackets, this is omega to the r plus m. We know that this is definitely a member of the set because we just proved closure. So this is equal to omega to the k times omega to the r plus m. And that's just equal to omega to the k plus r plus m. So to go ahead and show that the second part is true, the right hand side, we can just split this up again. That's equal to omega to the k plus r times omega to the m. So let's go down a little bit. And this is equal to omega to the k plus r and then times omega to the m on the outside. And that's just equal to omega to the k times omega to the r times omega to the m, which is the right-hand side that we wanted. So we prove that associativity holds for any general elements in the set. Now we're going to prove the third axiom of group theory. So give some more space. So the third axiom states the existence of an identity. This states that there should be some, or rather there should exist, some omega to the r, which is a member of the set, such that for any omega in the set, omega times omega to the r is equal to omega to the r times omega, sorry, omega to the k, which is equal to omega to the k. So it leaves all the elements in the set unchanged. We need to actually find what this element is, or prove its existence, but we can basically prove its existence by finding it. That's just the easiest way. This one's actually probably the most trivial to prove. We could just consider some r equals zero, so that omega to the r is equal to one. Therefore, omega to the k times omega to the r equals omega to the k times one, which equals one times omega to the k, which equals omega to the k. So the identity element must be omega to the zero, which equals one, which we know is a member of the set. Finally, this brings us to the fourth axiom, which is the existence of an inverse for each element number four. So this one's a little bit trickier than identities but it's really no more difficult than closure associativity. So we know there should exist some omega to the r such that omega to the r times omega to the k is equal to omega to k times omega to the r which is just equal to one, the identity element. Since we're dealing with nth roots of unity here it might be more helpful to write one as being equal to omega to the n. That's our definition of omega. So we could write say omega to the r times omega to k is equal to omega to the n. This is our requirement. We know omega to the r times omega to the k is omega to the r plus k. That needs to be equal to omega to the n. So this is true if r plus k is equal to n. And therefore we could say that r is equal to n minus k. Now we know that k is in our set of elements 0, 1, up to n minus 1. So we know that r will be in the set of elements. 
from 1 all the way up to n. But we discussed before, this is essentially the same as having r being the range 0 all the way up to n minus 1. They produce the same roots. So r being equal to n minus k is certainly allowed. So we know that for each element there exists an inverse r equal to m minus k. Or rather, for each omega to the k, there's an inverse omega to the n minus k. So we proved that this set, under multiplication, satisfies all four axioms of group theory, and therefore it must form a group.